Hello, my name is Aaron Danis, and I'm a faculty member at the National Intelligence University here in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the panel, Ethical Issues in Wargaming and Academia. We are fortunate that today's panel consists of two colleagues from King's College, Dr. David Banks and Ms. Ivanka Barzaska. Both have great presentations yesterday. I got a chance to be on one and watch the other one back last night. Uh, apologies, but Ms. Aggie Hurst had to withdraw from the panel today. Um, we hope her situation has improved. If you want the panelists' full bios, they're available on the conference app. Um, I will give just a, a short introduction to both. Ivanka is a founder and co-director of the King's Wargaming Network. She's a MacArthur-funded research associate at the Center for Security, excuse me, Science and Security Studies, where she examines how disruptive technologies affect nuclear risks by combining qualitative analysis, quantitative modeling, and strategic wargaming. She currently leads a project funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York on aerospace defense and nuclear risk focusing on the United States, NATO, and Russia. As part of the project, Ivanka directed a series of strategic war games at King's College London and at the UK Defense Academy during 2016, or excuse me, 2017 and 2018. She led the game design process that resulted in a new method of strategic war game. David is the international relations scholar who focuses on diplomatic history and practice and wargaming and conflict simulation. In the autumn of 2020, he joined the King's College War Studies Department as a wargaming lecturer and the academic director of the excellent King's Wargaming Network, um, one of my favorite places to visit on the web. Is that is that part of your bio, David? The excellent King's Wargaming Network. I added the excellent stuff. So. <laughs> it is excellent. Thanks to both of you, the work you do. His wargaming research has investigated the potential use of cyber weapons in future conflicts and counterinsurgency techniques against Boko Haram. He has also designed a number of conflict simulations for use in the classroom. His current wargaming research is focused on determining epistemological standards for evaluating wargames and simulations as a research method. In addition to his wargaming research, he also studies diplomatic practice in international society with a special emphasis on symbolic and rhetorical diplomacy. It's been published in International Studies Quarterly in a variety of media outlets. Welcome to both of you, and Ivanka will lead off. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Aaron, for this um, uh, this comprehensive introduction. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be joined by, uh, by Dr. Banks here today to talk about ethical issues in, in wargaming in, in academia. Um, and for my own piece, um, I will talk about analytical wargaming and research ethics and in academic integrity is how they and how they apply to to analytical games that is war games that are applied for for research purposes. Now, I should say that the, the views I present today are, are my own and don't uh, necessarily reflect an institutional position. Um, they are informed by my experience in, in directing and in designing and executing analytical war games at King's College London. Um, and they're also informed uh, by discussions with, with colleagues, um, in particular Dr. Banks and Dr. Aggie Hurst. Um, and uh, our aim at the King's Wargaming Network is to develop <clears throat> a set of guidelines for, for academic excellence in wargaming. But <clears throat> what you see today uh, from both um, myself and, and Davey are, are some provisional ideas in, in that direction. So Wargaming is an emerging academic discipline. Um, the King's Wargaming Network seeks to advance uh, this discipline in, in two ways. Uh, by furthering Wargaming as a method of inquiry um, and by furthering Wargaming as a method for learning and teaching. On the analytical wargaming side, we recognize uh, that there's a need to move wargaming in a more scientific direction. Um, you've heard me speak on this topic many times. Um, um, an example, uh, a good example is, is Dr. Uh, Banks offered um, remarks um, on what uh, this means with, with regard to ontology in, in game design uh, at this conference, and you can um, access his, his talk on, on YouTube um, and, and read his, his article when it comes out. And on the educational side, 
uh, we recognize the need for more purposeful design and application of, of war games. And Dr. Hurst um, has done some fascinating research on how games have been applied to this end uh, in the US military. So achieving and demonstrating academic excellence in both requires understanding ethics and academic integrity um, and how they apply to, to this uh, emerging discipline. Uh, they require implementing uh, these principles and also taking action when behaviors fall short. So wargaming is, is, is an emerging discipline. Uh, it's traditionally been practiced by uh, professional communities and interest uh, among scholars is, is relatively new. So why are we spending uh, so much time and effort on, uh, on advancing wargaming in, in academia? And there, um, uh, there are at least three reasons. The first is that there's this growing demand, growing interest in wargaming. Uh, in part, this demand has been driven by, by changes to the security environment, but we're starting to see um, a greater use of games. Um, so it's, it's becoming increasingly uh, important to have better guidelines, a more standardized way of, of doing wargaming right uh, as, as games expand outside of this professional community. Um, there's also um, a significant potential uh, for games to produce new thinking for um, generating new data that will drive both theoretical and applied research on really important topics uh, like, like nuclear deterrence, conflict escalation, cyber weapons, uh, topics on which real world data is scarce, uh, but these topics are really consequential to international security. So, um, you know, we expect war games to really um, set the stage, you know, come up with some new findings on, on these issues and so um, ensuring quality uh, in the methods and their application is, is very important. Um, and finally, we have a strong demand signal from policymakers uh, for war games. Uh, so these games shape their perceptions, uh, their understanding of the world. Um, and in some cases, they inform policy decisions and could also inform decisions in, in, in a real crisis uh, or, or war. So we uh, have a responsibility uh, as individuals um, who are using games for research, who are using games in the classroom to strive and ensure excellence by pursuing the highest quality um, possible in, in the methods, in the process, uh, in how we derive insights uh, from wargaming, and to do so with, uh, with care and respect for, for the individuals that are involved and sometimes uh, this requires a balance, it requires trade-offs, and, and ethics um, helps us make uh, these kinds of, of decisions. So academic excellence requires um, academic integrity and, and ethics, and um, I'll start with a discussion on, on some of the fundamental principles for academic integrity, what they mean, and what, how, what they mean for um, analytical war games. So to begin, what is um, an analytical war game? Um, we, need, we need to start with, with uh, at least a provisional uh, definition to see what is the scope within which these, uh, these principles need to be applied. Um, and um, I've offered um, um, some definitions here, which is an analytical war game is a game that is designed and used for research purposes. It has the aim for contributing new theoretical or empirical knowledge. Um, and, and importantly here, in, in this context, uh, war games um, are seen as methods for data collection. Uh, they are they're data generating processes. They elicit um, um, structure and record judgment from, from human subjects. Um, and so in this, this means that they, um, because they're a research method, research integrity principles apply, and because they um, are collecting data from human data subjects, research ethics principles apply. So how do these standards apply? Um, you know, we have uh, at King's, we're, we're um, a signatory to um, 
uh, various documents that set out uh, the expectations for research integrity. And, and these documents say that, you know, we're, we as researchers, we're expected to know what the standards of rigor are. Uh, we're expected to um, maintain those, those standards uh, at all times. But, but uh, how do they apply to this, this emerging discipline? Um, so I'll, I'll just review quickly what some of these um, principles are and um, you know, what you see here is, is, um, is King's uh, summary of, of, uh, of the principles. Uh, there are a number of, of documents that uh, frame these slightly different, differently, but ultimately they boil down to, to, um, to the same thing. So um, you have honesty in also aspect of the research, you have rigor in um, using the appropriate research methods in adhering to uh, agreed protocols in, in drawing interpretation from results. You have transparency and open communication um, in relation to the reporting of data collection methods, the analysis and interpretation of, of the data and, and research findings. And also you have uh, care and respect for all participants, uh, all individuals involved in, in the research process. The responsibility for, for all of this um, is, is an individual one. It's also a shared one. Um, it, it, it also requires um, taking action when, when some of these um, behaviors fall short. So let me offer uh, some views on what these individual responsibilities are uh, with regard to, to analytical wargaming. Um, so in, in demonstrating honesty and rigor, um, I mean, th what this means is, is, is demonstrating, you know, presenting reporting uh, on um, wargame design, on the, 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 the process in which wargames are um, applied and, and how results are, are derived. It, it also involves answering some questions about why you've chosen a specific game, why you've chosen a specific human subjects, how does that actually meet your, your, your question, um, are you following um, ethics and, and legal standards. And on, um, on the transparency side, um, it entails actually dedicating the time and effort to communicating both your method and, and your findings. Um, so this is an effort to, to, to publish, to, to make your methodology clear and, and reproducible, um, and also to, um, to make your data sets, uh, which you're collecting, uh, publicly available. There's also um, collective responsibility. Um, you know, we need to be able to ensure this rigor, to be able to um, answer these questions. We need more fundamental research on, you know, what can we know and how can we know through, through wargaming, what method is best suited for, for what purpose. Um, and we have um, uh, a responsibility for growing and ensuring that there are opportunities for greater transparency. And, and this conference is, is a perfect example of that. Um, I would just flag that uh, publishing um, wargaming methods and findings um, still remains a, a bit of an issue, but that's also starting to change. So I'll, I'll briefly talk about uh, the ethics aspect. So ethics is, is fundamentally about maximizing the benefit for individuals and in, in society and minimizing risk and harm. <clears throat> um, these are some of the, um, um, the, the ethics principles that are widely used to um, inform academic research. And the way they apply in, in analytical uh, games is, is, um, is twofold. Uh, now, now first, analytical games involve primary data collection from human subjects, so they are subject to review by an appropriate body, a research ethics committee, uh, but the testing of war games doesn't necessarily require 
um, that similar level of, of formal scrutiny because you're um, uh, if you're throwing out the data and you're not actually using it for 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 research purposes. So there are um, some issues that arise, um, ethical issues that arise in analytical games. Some of them relate to preserving the anonymity of, of um, participants. Um, as board games are run in group settings, uh, some of them relate to um, ensuring the confidentiality and integrity of, of uh, the data when you have a large research team uh, supporting the game. Um, we are also looking at uh, new information security risks that result in the change uh, uh, in the shift from um, manual in-person gaming to, uh, to games that are run uh, remotely in, in a digital environment. Um, and there's some, some questions raised about, um, you know, if, if your game is, is too immersive, then is that balance that you're trying to, to strike between uh, benefit, research benefit and harm to the individual, is that, is that the right one? Um, there's also the issue of, of legal compliance, which is, um, pertains to personal data. So war games that collect personal data are um, subject to relevant laws for data privacy and, and data protection. And importantly, these laws differ based on where, um, where the researcher, the, the research organization is based, but also where your participants are based. Um, you know, if you're collecting data from UK um, citizens and residents, you have one set of rules, EU nationals, you have a different um, set of rules. Um, so to sum up, research excellence in, in um, analytical wargaming requires um, a consideration of both uh, academic integrity and um, research ethics, and the responsibility for that falls on um, individuals, uh, but it also falls on their um, their organizations and also on, on the funders that support this research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ivanka. We have no questions in the queue yet. So at this point, we'll just turn it over to David and we'll hopefully catch all the questions at the end. Thanks. Great, wonderful. Thank you. I'll go ahead and share my uh, slides. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you, Ivanka, for uh, uh, the uh, leading off this discussion, and I think uh, very helpfully kind of giving us a definition of ethics, which can kind of inform uh, what I'm going to talk about now. <clears throat> and here I'm looking here at the ethical dilemmas associated with educational war games. And I have here some ethical dilemmas because this is something that I confess I've only started thinking about seriously in the last few months uh, after discussions with my colleagues, uh, Ivanka and, uh, and Dr. Aggie Hurst. And um, because I think for many of us who use games, and I'm one of them, we may not even be thinking that there's potentially ethical issues here with the use of games. Uh, we may just associate games with sort of fun team building activities. But here I want us to just be conscious of some of the ethical uh, issues uh, that, that can exist. And let me start by saying, I use games uh, frequently in, in my classes uh, in different ways, sometimes individual short games that might only last a half an hour, sometimes games that will last the duration of an entire, say, three-hour class, and other instances where a game might be played out over a week, or even in some cases over uh, a number of weeks, uh, or indeed nearly a whole semester. Uh, here uh, at the left and in the middle are two examples of commercial games I've used in the classroom. Uh, one here is Mideast Peace on the left, uh, which is a not quite, it's basically a war game, but it has some nice interesting twists, which is one of the reasons I like to include it. Uh, Panic on Wall Street is an economic game uh, where players are buying and selling. Uh, and here on the right is a game of my own uh, construction uh, or design called The July Crisis, uh, which I've played with students uh, and has been modified over time. And I hope, intend to write it up and publish it at some point uh, once the rules stay still. Now, what do I mean by an educational game? And this is a provisional definition um, subject to consistent and constant revision. Here, I consider an educational game to be representations of conflicts, competitions, or coordination problems in which individuals pursue objectives, make decisions, and experience and respond to the consequences of the decisions. They are used to improve participants' understanding of some element of existing theories, concepts, historical events, or dynamics, e.g. political, military, economic, and so on. 
And so that's the kind of, you know, it's a pretty straightforward definition, but it really is about improving understanding. It's not about gaining new knowledge um, or gaining surprising knowledge, but rather it's more about gaining insights and understanding uh, uh, about something that we already have some sort of uh, uh, academic understanding of to begin with. It's to help the students to be able to understand ideas that might otherwise seem a little bit uh, distant uh, or not easy to uh, uh, internalize. And I found, as I'm sure many people uh, who use games in educational settings find that they can be excellent for this internalization dynamic. Very often students will play games, they'll be told very, or rather, sorry, let me say it differently. They'll often learn concepts that seem quite obvious or quite ordinary and then wonder why these cause so much confusion in the real world. So they'll learn something like information problems in negotiation and say, God, this is so simple. If players, you know, if actors just did this, their problems would go away. And then you make them play a game that simulates those, those, those information problems. And suddenly they find that when they're actually being tasked with doing it themselves, they find it much more difficult. And so this, of course, can be the great payoff uh, for these kinds of things. However, they do also create a number of ethical dilemmas. And so I've been thinking over the last few months about some of the ethical dilemmas that these games uh, present. Um, and when we, when we use them in the classroom, both games that you might select from commercial publishers or games you design yourself. And I want to list some of them here. And in talking about some of these prominent dilemmas, in each case, I'm going to just briefly mention what I think, you know, why it is we have to, what, what motivates these kinds of decisions in our design or our use of games and the games that we select, but then the ethical dilemmas that are associated with that decision. So the most obvious one is issues around commission and omission. That is to say the rules that are included and the rules that are not included. Um, and so any, any game, especially games you're likely to use in classrooms, have to have a pretty limited rule set. Uh, and even more advanced games are going to have a limited rule set where certain things are the real things that matter and other things are the things that don't matter. And so the games then uh, are going to kind of highlight specific dynamics. So here uh, on the right, we have a picture of the well-known uh, board game, Axis and Allies, uh, which uh, depicts uh, World War II at a strategic level. And it has all the kinds of things that you might associate with a game like that. It's got resources and factories and different kinds of weapon systems and territories that are worth uh, resource points and so on and so forth. Notably absent from Axis and Allies, and indeed absent from most war games, is any real sense of victimhood. And um, most games uh, do a pretty poor job, I should think, and I say this as a hobby war gamer, do a pretty poor job of giving you any sense of actually real harm or real victimhood. And especially games around World War II uh, do a interesting job of essentially ignoring the Holocaust uh, for the most point, which, which if it's happening, is not happening uh, in the game. Now, that said, well, why is that a dilemma? Well, the dilemma is people are learning from these games. Uh, these are representations of reality. And so we have to be careful that, firstly, we're turning war into a game. And um, this is something that's very, very difficult for a recurring problem in, in, in teaching about politics in general, um, uh, is that it's, it's sometimes very hard to bring humanity back into the discussion. And there's a, a, a what the author Carol Cohn calls a techno-strategic language, which refuses to allow you to talk about the actual physical harm of war. And to talk like that is to, be, to identify yourself as a quote unquote unserious person. But the games can replicate that problem. And so what will happen is students will be put in a position to uh, play these games, and then they might think that this is essentially the, what politics really is. I mean, here I'm using politics as an example, obviously, but politics of more is, and, and, and they're, they're, they're not seeing these other elements, right? So they're not actually seeing what these other dimensions of war are. And remember, they are learning, right? They're learning from this game. This game acts then as a synthetic experience that when they're thinking about what violence and war is, many people, of course, are gonna rely on things like movies and TV shows and books, and now here's another Here's another thing that's giving them a synthetic experience. And very often, similar to the way movies do, they're leaving out a lot of the grisly bits and a lot of the difficult to digest bits. There's other issues here. There's issues of representation, uh, which is related to this, was not quite the same thing. It's how do you want them to, see, how, how do you want to kind of visualize the game, right? So you may have a game where you're going to have a certain set of rules, but then how are you actually going to paint that map, right? How are you going to color that in? Uh, how are you going to visualize the different enemies? How are you going to, you know, this is a story here of kind of, you know, aesthetics, right? I mean, are you going to depict them using a particular type of art? Are you going to depict them using a, a, a particular uh, type of map and a representation that's supposed to, uh, you know, uh, evoke a particular era or time? 
Now, why do you want to do this? Well, you might want to do it because it helps with immersion, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, but it also, you know, it can be useful because uh, you might want to you might want to get them to to be primed in a certain way. This here is introductory text from my own game, The July Crisis. Each of the there's six teams in this game, and they're all uh, it's sort of uh, simulating or representing the period preceding World War One, and and it's just after the assassination of Franz Ferdinand. And all of the teams have one last chance to try to negotiate peace before war breaks out. Each of the teams receive their, their flavor text or receive their, their, their individual objectives. And above those objectives, they get distinct flavor text. And this here is the flavor text uh, for France. I won't go into all the details. You can read it here, obviously. But you're getting a sense here of an extremely revanchist France, right? One that is uh, menaced by Germany, uh, that is finally going to take this opportunity to uh, crush uh, the German nemesis while also protecting its, its, its Mediterranean holdings. This is done on purpose. I'm trying to prime this team to dislike Germany. Um, I, that's part of the dynamic I'm trying to get by doing this, but you know, it's, it's, it's doing that, right? It's, it's creating a particular vision. For many students, this is their closest experience they'll get to World War I in terms of how much they've read about it. And they may come away thinking that this is a fair representation of French thought vis-a-vis -vis Germany and the world in general. Furthermore, I mean, it's offensive, right? I mean, this is, this is, this is a text that I think we're far enough away in history that most people are probably unlikely to be offended, but you could well be offended by this, right? This is not this is a caricature of a very particular form of French nationalism, um, and it's not a very flattering one. And so representation, uh, this is another issue with this, right? Is how are we actually going to uh, represent particular uh, peoples or groups uh, uh, or proclivities uh, in ways that we we have to be concerned that it may not it may actually be offensive to 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 individuals. Now, another dilemma, of course, is the dilemma associated with immersion, right? And, and obviously, representation is just one way that we try to immerse uh, players when they're playing games. There's lots of other dynamics we might try to create. But of course, this visualization dynamic and this aesthetic dynamic is a very important one. Now, why in a classroom, and of course, I'm using classroom examples here, why would you want immersion? Well, of course, immersion here is crucial uh, for this magic circle, right? We want to get people to buy into the game. And one of the best ways to get players to buy into the game is to give them things that help them experience it, right? Give them these small tools or props uh, that can help them feel like they're there and can help them feel the part. And um, when I play the, when I have my students play that 19, uh, 14 July crisis game, uh, when they meet for their negotiations, I have a tiny gavel and the chair loves to swing the gavel with great enthusiasm, right? Just this tiny little prop can do a great deal for creating uh, this experience. So what's the ethical downside of immersion, right? We might think, well, these are immersive things. Uh, uh, these can be, uh, you know, very good for getting them to to um, um, uh, to to experience the game. Well, the, the potential downside here is you may actually be asking them to do things that they feel very morally uncomfortable with, right? You're trying to immerse them by pulling them in here with particular events or ideas in the game, uh, but it, it may come at the cost where they may be asked to behave in ways that they actually find troubling. Um, now. You know, we shouldn't assume this is going to be a frequent issue necessarily, but it's one that we can't just remove or discount, right? It's not one that we can just uh, uh, throw away. And here's an example of this, right? This is a um, Volker Runke's a very uh, uh, excellent game, Labyrinth, the War on Ter Terror, where uh, the uh, jihadi player, as they're called in the game, has a number of different wing conditions, but one of which is to detonate a WMD in the United States, right? If they can successfully detonate a single WMD, they automatically win the game. That's very immersive. Uh, but also, it's a very troubling thing potentially uh, to have uh, uh, people uh, um, to think about, you know, and to have them kind of play this out sy synthetically. Uh, some people may find this to be very unpalatable. And then, lastly, uh, there's another issue here of obligation, right? Because the obvious thing here to say is, well, if students don't want to play the game, uh, uh, don't make them play the game. But it's easy to say that, right? It's easy for a, a, a educator to stand at the top of the room, and this is especially true in a university setting, and to say to them, uh, look, if you don't want to play these games, you don't have to play them. Uh, but those students are going to recognize that they're standing out if they say they don't want to play. So very often they may have some sort of uh, uh, dislike of this game on an ethical level, um, and uh, they may feel like that they're being obliged to play it. Now, the obvious response to this is university classrooms are not, play and again, I'm speaking from a university setting, but any educational setting is not necessarily a place where your feelings or your personal ideas are supposed to be reinforced. I, I subscribe to that view. I don't think that university classrooms uh, should be sanitized, and I don't believe that 
uh, it's necessary here to uh, uh, to to walk on eggshells around issues that are that are not easy to sugarcoat. However, it is a little bit different. Uh, if you're teaching a class on the Holocaust or if you're teaching a class about nuclear warfare, I think if students find that to be very unpalatable subject matter, they know that going in. And it's very easy for a professor to stand at the top of a classroom and say, look, we're going to be discussing some very gruesome stuff here. And I'm going to be asking you to engage with some very gruesome material. And that's the price of admission. There's no other way to do this, that this is a university classroom. However, that's not the same thing as asking them to play a game about it. Right? It's one thing to say, I want you to study the Holocaust. It's another thing to say, I want you to, to, to pretend to be a participant uh, in the Holocaust. Uh, and that's a very different thing to ask them to do. And furthermore, most students are not going to know that that's what they signed up for, right? I think it's fair for an educator to say, you must have known you were signing up for stuff like this before you came into the classroom. Uh, but you can't, most students don't know they were, you know, most students won't even know you're going to plan to use a game, right? That might not even be in the course description. Uh, and so they can't know. And so it's very difficult then uh, for you to, um, to be able to, uh, um, ask them to do that. The other element of this, um, which I wasn't quite sure to place it, I placed it in obligation, but is to also remember that they might take gaming quite personally. Um, you know, students here, when they play these games, if they're competitive, that's of course what generates a lot of the energy inside them, but also they often really feel the loss uh, or really, you know, exult in the win. And they can often take it quite personally. And it can be a little bit fractious sometimes. Sometimes people can fall out playing these games, either across teams or within teams. And that's kind of a lot to ask students to sign up for, right? I, I might be, you might come out of this like, having fights with people uh, that you didn't expect to have. And so there's, these are some, some sort of real issues. Now, how do we address these? Well, there isn't a simple answer to these questions, uh, to the question of how to address these dilemmas. But I want to propose at least a few very briefly uh, that can help to kind of perhaps help an educator who's concerned about, well, how am I going to square this circle? How, how can I be conscious of all these ethical things and still include games in the classroom that I think are going to be able to do the educational work that I want them to do. And so here I want to propose just a few uh, possible responses. One is ask yourself why it is you're using the game. Because, and especially this is especially true of a commercial game, right? When you select a game, any game or design a game, it's going to come with all those trade-offs, right? You're going to be trading off, uh, you know, what rules you're including, what way you're representing things, what way how you're going to try to immerse the players, what you're going to be asking them to do inside that game. And especially if you're selecting commercial games, different games are going to be touching on those ethical touchstones in slightly different ways. So for example, if, if the purpose of the game is you want students to experience negotiation, you want them to have an experience of what it's like to have to negotiate things with other actors, some of whom may be, you know, may be misrepresenting their position or lying. Well, you could buy one of two games commercially, Secret Hitler or The Resistance, both of which do very similar things, right? These are very popular, well-known uh, commercial hobby games uh, uh, where there's, there's essentially hidden identities, right? A bunch of players are negotiating, trying to get certain outcomes, and some of the players are actually secretly trying to, to, to make the game lose. Uh, in Secret Hitler, it's the fascists. In The Resistance, it's, you know, the evil government. Now, if your concern is, I don't want to have students playing something that I think might be a little bit, um, uh, you know, kind of off color, well, choose the resistance, right? They're very similar games. They're not the same, but they're very similar. And if the real thing you want to get across is the negotiation dynamic, then essentially what you can do is you can choose abstraction over representation and immersion. Uh, and that can cause a lot of those things to recede into the background. So think about why you want them to play it. If, however, on the other hand, you do want to have something that's not just simulating the negotiation, but also somewhat representative of a time period or an event. I know an educator who intentionally has chosen Secret Hitler precisely because they want it to be this warning from history. It's a simple game, but they want to be having the students talk about fascism and liberalism and talk about how these things operate as part of this game experience, as well as having uh, this game uh, played. So think about what it is you're trying to actually get out of uh, the experience for the students, and that can help you perhaps select which of the kind of ethical compromises you're more willing to make, um, right? where you're willing to let go more uh, uh, versus where you're going to say, look, I'm going to select this game. I know that there's some issues here that might generate, but I feel like the payoffs are worth it. The other thing here you can do is you can try to reduce the stakes. If, if the easiest way out of this uh, is to just tell the students who don't feel comfortable playing games 
uh, to say, let them opt out, then reduce the stakes of opting out, right? Make it easier for them to do so. The most obvious way, of course, is to not associate grades in any way, shape or form with the outcome of the game, uh, which I've never done because it's not fair that students get graded on whether or not they win uh, because that's not really the kind of knowledge that you're trying to produce in a classroom necessarily uh, and have them be able to reflect back to you. So don't grade them on that. Grade them instead on the reports or the other kind of documents or the kinds of materials they have to produce during the course of playing the game. Something which I've never done, this is something I've just thought of recently in response to my own kind of thinking about these issues, is uh, you can also create non-game participant roles, not non, sorry, non sort of uh, team roles uh, that so people can still participate. For example, you might create an option if you have some sort of war game where you might say, well, somebody if they don't want to play as one, on one of the teams can choose to play the role as a journalist uh, or choose to play the role as something else. They'll still have to produce some sort of uh, materials. They'll still have to engage with the game. They'll still have to produce work, but they're not going to be obliged to participate in some sort of way that they feel like is somewhat, somewhat objectionable. Uh, those are just two ways. I'm sure there's others, but those are two of thought. And the last here I would suggest is ask and explain. Ask first and foremost the ethics officer of whatever organization uh, you're part of what exactly the ethical position, uh, the official ethical position is uh, for uh, that organization with regards to using games in the classroom. As Ivanka outlined earlier, universities have a long tradition, at least a few decades long, of having very strong ethical protocols about using uh, uh, subjects in research. And professors have to jump through enormous amount of uh, important uh, 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 Kind of hurdles in order to do this. However, it's uh, it, it's it, with with gaming in particular, it tends to be much more of a free for all. So be sure first about whether or not games are something that you should be using in your classroom. But then after that, ask the students. You can ask the students ahead of time. Is there's anything that's a really big red flag for them? Uh, you can ask them discreetly, anonymously, uh, but you can ask them if there's anything that's a big red flag and see if that's something you can avoid in the game you produce. Afterwards. When you do the hot wash of the game, don't just try to hot wash it around whatever the educational learning outcome was. You can also potentially offer offer them to to uh, an opportunity to respond to those particular ethical uh, dimensions I outlined, and perhaps some other ones as well. Do you think that this was in bad taste? Do you think that this you were being asked to do something that was unpleasant? And now you'll at least know for the next iteration of that game. And finally, explain to the students why it is that they're using the game. In my experience, when students resist any kind of uh, um, um, assignment, very often when you explain to them very clearly why it is you're assigning them, what it is you think the learning outcome, uh, how you think it meets particular learning outcomes, you'll find that at least some of the resistance tends to reduce uh, as long as they understand why they're being asked to do it. And once that's clear to them, you, you, they may feel that the obligation isn't so onerous. Okay, I will leave the presentation there and I'm very happy to take uh, any questions in the Q&A. All right, thank you, David. Um, we have a, a, a question to prime the pump, and we can thank Ivanka for this. And if you could put it up on the banner. Um, and the question is this, should universities require ethical clearance for educational war games? I think that's a, a really a great question. And, and an even better follow-up to that, are universities um, geared or equipped to do that? So um, I'll turn it over to you. Um, so, I mean, I think they should at least talk about it. That would be my feeling about this. I'm not sure if there, if there absolutely has to be ethical clearance per se, because I don't think it works, it's the same kind of issue as we see with um, research. But I do, think, um, I do think that it's a discussion that probably needs to start being had at universities if they're going to be serious about using gaming in some way. Uh, whatever the ethics committee or ethics review system that they have is, and I'm not exactly sure what the architecture of that looks like in Kings. I've only been there for a year. These can be usually pretty Byzantine operations. But whoever that body is should at least start talking about this uh, and start figuring out, um, is this something that we need to worry about? As I said, my experience of this in my academic career has been that what you do in the classroom, they really are very, they give you a lot of latitude. And I do think that's correct. I mean, I don't think university classrooms uh, are places where people should not feel challenged. I feel like they should be feel, feel challenged all along every dimension, but we need to figure out you know, where that's moving from challenging to obnoxious or unethical. Um, and I think it's, it's a discussion worth having at a formal level. I don't know if where I'd land on that. Well, and, and let, oh. sorry, you're- No, I'm hear. sorry, you, you ready to answer your question? <laughs> I'm ready to answer. Well, I wanna, I wanna make the case 
for ethical review of educational gains because I think what's what's going on is something um, very uh, new and different, particularly when we're using war games at the Department of, of War Studies. Um, and you know the you know the experience that we've had with with Davy has been you know contact the ethics officer that are frankly unprepared to answer this question and say well you know this we don't really think this is an issue so I don't think they're they're equipped they don't fully understand um, what ethics means for this new academic uh, discipline. Um, and, and the the question, I mean, the fundamental question, ethical question in educational gaming is is again about that balance. You know, do the educational benefits exceed the potential risks and the potential harm to students? And I think there's it, it would really depend on the game because if you are putting um, you the educator, you the module convener, as as we call it in in, in the UK, uh, you're in a position of power. And you're asking uh, a student and potentially grading them on this um, to, for example, role play uh, and in, in, a, in a conflictual environment. Um, and so this can induce bullying behavior. This can induce um, you know, all sorts of things that need to be considered, need to be discussed. Uh, we need to be aware of uh, you know, when we see problems that we're able to identify them and then be really thoughtful about the steps that need, can be taken to mitigate them. And I'm not suggesting uh, don't use games in the classroom, although I'm, I'm very grateful for not having to, David not you know, requiring me to play any of his, his uh, excellent games. Um, but, uh, but I think we need to be very thoughtful about the, the ethical issues that, that these raise and how to mitigate them. All right, thank you. Um, and, and as kind of a follow-up to that, um, I had a, a question that I wanted to ask because th this has come up in, in my classroom. I started using games a couple of years ago, and most of mine deal with either counterterrorism or counterinsurgency as threats. And um, uh, if they can get the uh, it up on the banner, and the question is this, do we have a responsibility as educators to pre-screen our students for real-world experiences that could collide with an educational gaming experience. For example, I had a student who I didn't realize, and fortunately I didn't have him play in any of the, these, these games, who um, had been as a child involved in the Rwandan genocide. He gave a presentation on it. It was clearly very personable, personal to him and was um, uh, very uh, animated and upset about it the more he talked about it. So, I mean, if we had done a game on, on something to do with the, with a genocide someplace, would that have impacted them? Should we be pre-screening our students with questionnaires? I'll leave it up to you. I might, you want to tackle that one first? Well, I mean, I think here you would, um, you would apply the, the principle of, of informed consent um, to, yeah, you know, I think what, you know, David was 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 um, absolutely right in his remarks and saying, "Well, this um, you know you need to um, give students an alternative because this isn't the same as requiring everyone to write a research paper. You're asking them to live through, to participate actively in something that could that could um, result in in trauma or stress or um, you know some kind of harm. So providing them, asking them explicitly, is this something you wish to participate in?" And making sure that the consequences for them in saying no, um, you know, that there are no negative consequences for them in saying no, and then they'll just end up doing something else that would result in 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 a similar um, educational benefit. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's definitely worth being sensitive to, and one hundred percent. I had an interesting discussion with a friend of mine who's from Northern Ireland because there's a in that coin series that that labyrinth is the kind of first one of and it is all this coin games that gmt have produced you may know there's a northern ireland one coming out and i told him oh there's a normal Ireland. there's, there's the troubles is coming out what do you think about that and he happily plays board games with me for a decade and he said oh that's kind of a bad taste and <laughs> it was in bad taste because finally the game had caught up with him right i mean this was a you know it didn't seem so abstract when it was you know he grew up in belfast um, and suddenly these this game is representing that and so I think that's I think that's right. I think very often in these classrooms, it, it you know there's a distancing effect, and a lot of the topics that are chosen 
are things that are, are very often, especially in a Western classroom, are going to be far away from uh, Western students. And so it feels really easy to be really kind of um, uh, disconnected. I, I think, and then, and then you, may, you may accidentally be asking people to do something that they, they think is, 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 is really something they don't want to be part of. I think the, the I wouldn't say I would pre-screen the students for real world experiences. I think I would do something closer to what Ivanka said, which is to essentially just give them the opportunity to opt out. So they don't have to offer any explanation. As I've said before, I don't make gaming, you know, it's, it's, it's never worth any significant grades. Um, and it's primarily been done for two reasons in, in, when I use it in the classroom. One is to help politics come alive. Um, and the other is to help create uh, a tighter, this is a secondary goal, but it usually also generates a very strong cohort effect, right? So those students usually become very close. At some occasions they fall out, but 19 times out of 20, they get along. And so we think about here the kind of benefits, right? You know, most students walk away going, that was great. I'm really glad that happened. Even students thought they were going to hate it. Not everyone, but definitely the vast majority of my experience. So there's, that's the trade-off, right? You're going to lose it if you take it away. And also for a lot of students, it's very clarifying. Like they will walk away and say, I really couldn't understand bargaining until we played that card game. And now I understand bargaining. Like I, I couldn't get it. And now I can get it. And I can actually understand it when I want to write about it. So it wasn't just a lark. Um, but yes, you've got to, you've got to make sure that they that they can somehow step out of that experience if they want to. And so I think you know at a minimum you don't make it the centerpiece of of a class in any way, shape, or form. Right? It's 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 going to be something that's going to be a, a useful and edifying experience, um, but it's not something that's going to be uh, very important. In, in in the UK system, the grading system that we have at Kings is we distinguish between summative assessment and formative assessment, where summative is the stuff that will actually go into your that will make up your grade performative is just the stuff that's useful um but it's not actually going to be graded and get receive a mark so it's very much in that category over over here for me which is that you know it would be useful for you but you you can you can stay out of it there is a tension here um that i think is very real that isn't unique to games at all uh, but it's just the way it's expressing itself is unique which is at what point do you have to push students out of something that they don't want to do um, and so I'm not saying that that makes it okay, but that's, that is a recurring issue in classrooms. And especially in, you know, it's not something that comes up in, you know, physics classes because people don't have personal opinions about physics, but people have personal opinions about politics and they have personal opinions about history. And so they often react to it very, very explosively in classrooms when they get content about it that they don't want to receive. And it's not the job of university educators to shield them from that. But I do recognize Ivanka's point that there's something different here, right? This is not the same as making them have to read about the Holocaust, right? It's, it's something different. Uh, but at the same time, we can't, and I think this is why it's something that educators need to start talking about more broadly, is it can't be based on the kind of, the, the kind of satisfaction of the least happy student, right? So it's threading that needle is a very difficult one because if we, you know, it, it can't be that kind of obviously kind of customer driven, the response, but, but I do recognize it's very different. So it's a tricky one. And I've only started thinking about it in the last few months in discussions I've had with Ivan and Aggie. Um, I just posted to the um, chat room a, um, <clears throat> a post from Board Game Geek of all places, one of my favorite places to go when I'm looking to shop for a new game. I, know. I was looking to purchase <laughs> um, a game uh, called Opaque War by Javier Romero a couple weeks back. And it's about the war in the Ukraine. And one of the people in there posted his experience playing the game against somebody from the Ukraine. It's rather eye-opening. So I'll just leave it there for people who want to read that. And there's also a comment in there from one of our um, folks who are watching right now about um, his son and his experiences um, having been in a refugee camp. So um, uh, that's also worth looking at. Um, my, I guess my one, my follow-up question here, are there any topics that should be off limits for educational games? And my point of reference for this is the New York Times article from 2019 about should we be gaming people who are Nazis and racists and colonialists and that kind of thing. And I posted that link into the chat as well. That question has come up and I know in the commercial gaming sector, folks who do a lot of gaming of like the you know, World War II sometimes get the, the rap that they are um, pro-German or pro-Nazi or something like that. Um, are there topics that you think should be absolutely off limits or maybe uh, there has to be, it should be a waiting period or cooling off period before we tackle them in games? 
Ivanka? Sorry, that was an easy question. <laughs> my apologies. No, I mean, uh, my, my reaction to this is that there isn't um, a topic that should be off limits. I mean, we use games to explore nuclear war, conflict escalation, um, but I, I think what, what should be off limits is um, the kinds of things that you require players to do. And if you are, um, and here I, I point to the distinction between educational games and games that seek to entertain, because you can take a board game that was designed primarily for entertainment to use it in the classroom. Um, but the main difference there is, is, is agency, meaning do, you know, as, as an individual, you choose to buy that game, you choose to play it with your friends. As a student, um, your professor gives you this game and requires you to play it. So you don't have, without the agency to opt out, your, uh, this is something that, that you have to do. And if that game um, asks you to, puts you in a, in a conflictual environment, asks you to exhibit um, adversarial behavior to, to your classmates, uh, to induce stress in others, to um, to bully others, that that's off limits, and um, you know we know the kinds of things that we want to avoid, and I think very this would very much depend on um, you know the, the the game itself, and then just thinking through the design and and what and, and really being really thoughtful about you know what some what are some of those risks. Yeah, I I I, I think my answer to that is also my instinct answer is to say no, nothing's nothing's ever off limits in, in, a, in a classroom. I mean, it's a question of what's, what's the point of, of, of bringing it in. Um, you know, it's, it's why, why, are you, why are you asking them to play this, right? So if you are choosing something that's an extremely sensitive subject because you just want, oh, I want to do a game that'll get them thinking about politics, but I'll go ahead and choose something that's really a very sensitive subject in some way. Well, that's, that's kind of, I think, this is my point about how to resolve some of these dilemmas. Well, figure out what it is you're trying to get them to experience. If, however, the part of what you want them to experience is, you know, the, how people might be, you know, might have been compromised by something or how they find themselves doing things that they think they wouldn't do, well, then maybe you would select a game that, that sort of does that, right? And, and I think if you look, a lot of interesting games have come out in the last few years in the hobby community that are increasingly touching on issues that people essentially, I think, thought they could never game about before, right? So there's game freedom about the Underground Railroad. Um, there's, uh, uh, you know, work, the work by Cole Worley on, 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 on the British East India Company. Those games are designed to make you reflect on what's actually going on here, right? In this game, Infamous Traffic, you play the role of an opium smuggler into China, but he has extensive design notes sort of saying, well, this is, how that could be incentivized, right? How you could find yourself wanting to do that. Um, and so I, I think that that can be quite useful in some way because I think, you know, one of the, I, I totally take, I think the one that worries me in some ways the most is, is things that might trigger, um, you know, memories or, or some sort of experiences that, they, that, that students really didn't um, want to have brought back to them. And the other one that I've actually mentioned, I think is very important is the bullying aspect where there's a tendency here that it could become so aggressive that it actually tips over to something else. However, the, you know, one of the things that's very useful about games like this is it reveals to students n things about human nature that they don't really have the ability to experience otherwise, right? I mean, this is one of the things that they can be quite useful because politics, and I speak as a political scientist, it, it's very far away for most people, right? And it's not something that they really feel like is that they experience. And also critically, I think very often people think, well, I wouldn't do that, right? I mean, the classic is the Stanley Milgram test, right? Where people are like, well, I wouldn't you know, I wouldn't follow orders. And it's like, no, statistically you would follow orders. And so it's useful for you to, to, to kind of realize that, that you're not the person who wouldn't do these things. And, and so I think that games can be interesting that like negotiation games, like the, the, the World War I one I designed and obviously diplomacy, it, it gives students an opportunity to kind of engage in skullduggery and, you know, outmaneuver people, right? Like we're going to tell the we're going to tell the Austrians to wait for a day before we respond, but actually we're going to use that day to outmaneuver them and actually break off the Russians. And I have the students talk about this after the class, like that they they were able to outflank somebody, uh, and now they can understand that better, right? And if you if they didn't have the game, when else would they do that, right? So when else would they get to experience that dimension of politics? And so, 
the, the problem, particularly with war games and political games, is they are fundamentally conflictual, right? I mean, politics is a conflictual space. Um, and so it's a very difficult needle to thread because if you're going to do a political war game, it is going to be conflictual, right? I, I don't, I, you know, politics for me is about power and who's got it and who's using it. And so if you suck all of that out of it, it's not going to work. Now, that said, in other places, in other classrooms, you don't have that problem, right? For games like economic games, that competition recedes somewhat, right? Because it's more about maximizing your individual gain, not trying to harm somebody else. It's usually because you capture the market, not because you took their capital. But so that the, the element of sort of uh, uh, conflict is not as strongly pronounced. But I think it's an unavoidable dimension of political and war games is you're going to have these kind of, it's going to bring out people's aggressive edge. We do have a question from the audience. I think we primed the pump. So the, now we're pumping some questions. Um, the next question is, depending on the, the class and war game, should educators provide our students with different ethical theories that may be addressed in the war game before they play the game? It's part of the, I guess, the game prep. So I, I think here, um, one of the things that motivates the way I design my own classroom um, is, is an article by, I mentioned earlier by Carol Cohn called Sex and Death, uh, where she was working as a, I think, a Stanton Fellow on nuclear politics. And she realized that the more she was studying with these nuclear politics experts, the less they talked about who would die in a nuclear war. And she found that, I mentioned this earlier, when she tried to talk about that, they, all of her colleagues wouldn't take her seriously. She's like, I don't, it's not that I don't understand what you're talking about. I don't understand why you won't, it's a, why it's impossible for us to talk about victims when we talk about nuclear weapons. Instead, we talk about counter force and counter value and target packages and all this kind of stuff. And uh, she so called this techno strategic language, right? And it's that if you don't speak in the techno strategic language, you can't participate, but the techno strategic language won't talk about what the weapons are used for. And so this is a recurring problem, I think, at every stage of, of, of studying politics and, and history, especially politics, because a lot of the theories do have this really sanitized, crispy language, right? Bargaining theory, we coerced our opponent, you know, they refused to recognize our signal. Um, and so I try to do a thing in the classroom, in most of my classes, where I spend the first day reminding people what wars look like. Uh, because I realize as soon as we start talking about them analytically, a lot of that stuff, it gets vaporized, right? It, it disappears. So I think it could be useful to remind them. But at least most theories of politics don't do a good job of including this stuff. And so it's very hard to keep it at the front. Bonk, anything you want to add? I think I mean, the, the question basically alludes to, you know, you know, can you use games to, um, to demonstrate different ethical dilemmas? And I think you could, I think games would be very effective in, in doing that because ethics is about human choice. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I, I definitely agree with that. In fact, there's a, a good video game, which I know I've mentioned before, called Papers, Please, where you play the role of a bureaucrat of some totalitarian state, a passport control. It's a video game. And you have to choose whether or not to start letting people violate their, you know, smuggle themselves across the border but at the same time, you have a family that you're trying to protect. And so the game keeps asking you, well, are you going to, you know, you know, somebody will say, please let me in. I don't have a passport. My wife's waiting for me. But you realize if you don't stamp that passport, you won't get paid that day. And then your kid will get sick or something. It's a very clever game for, and it's very intentionally designed to, to really be an ethical game where you're, where you really realize that these are difficult choices. So I would agree with Ivanka that you can, you could have games like that in the classroom, but those course get back to that issue of then would students appreciate being made feel like they have to go through those ethical dilemmas um thank you um somebody posted in the chat and people can check it out after um a post about a it looks like a video game I, i've heard of this but i have no firsthand experience with it called this war of mine where you actually experience war as a civilian as opposed mm -hmm. to as a soldier uh, i don't know if either one of you have any experience with that but it sounds like an interesting premise um, it's something I'll have to look into after uh, our panel's over today. Um, either one of you have any experience with that and any, anything you can comment on? Or Yeah, I, I briefly played it. Yeah, I mean, that's right. I mean, the, the setting is you're the, 
you're trying to protect, so you're a civilian who's trying to just survive in a massive war zone. Um, and you have no agency and ability to affect the outcome of the war. You're just trying to be a survivor inside the war. Uh, that's that's a very interesting one. There's another interesting game that's free that's called Cart Life, C-A-R-T-L-I-F-E, which is about trying to make it as a vendor of, you know, like coffee in a small cart on the on the absolute economic precipice. It's a really, really good game. And, and, and it's all about ethical choices as well. So I, I'm just, I, unfortunately, I think that, um, or not unfortunately, I, these designs don't seem to be very prominent, but I think there's a real space for them. All right, thank you. Well, we've actually hit the top of the hour, and there is um, nothing else I see in the queue, unless there's anything else popping up at the end. It doesn't appear to be. So we can just wrap up here. I'd like to thank both of you for a very thought-provoking panel today. Um, thank you for, for filling the time of our lost panelists. And uh, hopefully, as people get a chance to watch this back, they'll be able to. There's a lot I took out of it for my own courses, and uh, something I'm going to have to think about going forward. Seeing I'm doing all these terrorism and coin courses, um, those are uh, those are challenging as it is. But I, I really um, focusing on the ethical piece, is something I'll take forward and take out of this panel. So thank you both. Great. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Bye bye.